Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk. Thank you, David, for the very nice introduction. And I would like to thank a lot of people. Uh, thank you for the, uh, no, the, the PC chairs, Anna and David, for choosing me, uh, for your trust uh, that I can give a good talk. And thank you for uh, my friends who nominated me uh, to, 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 to do this talk. I am very uh, grateful. Uh, and this talk, this work is uh, joint work with a lot of people, uh, too many to be listed. Uh, but mostly uh, in Baidu uh, research in uh, Sunnyvale, United States, and also in the headquarters of Baidu in Beijing. Um, and uh, a lot of my students from Oregon State University uh, participate in this research as interns at Baidu Research USA. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will introduce the topic that is simultaneous translation. Um, and so first, some background. Uh, on, on the uh, simultaneous interpretation. So as we know, there are two modes of human interpretation. One is consecutive interpretation, and the other is simultaneous interpretation. Uh, and in their literature, I mean, in the translation slash interpretation literature, interpretation always means spoken translation, and translation always means uh, written translation. Whereas in our field, uh, translation can mean both speech to speech, or speech to text, or text to text, or or text to speech, anything. So in this talk, I'll use these two words uh, rather interchangeably. So, so because simultaneous translation aims to automate uh, simultaneous interpretation. So consecutive interpretation on the left, uh, you can imagine when President Trump and President Xi Jinping met, uh, they would do this in a very slow way. That you know, when Xi Jinping, you know, uh, say a sentence or two, uh, Trump uh, uh, and his interpreter would translate into English for Trump, and Trump will respond in one or two sentences, and, and the American translator uh, interpreter will uh, translate back to uh, Chinese. But that's very slow, because a one-hour conversation between you and me would take them two hours at least, right, at the very least. And considering how important their time is, well, maybe not for Trump, because he spends most of his time uh, treating and playing golf, but you know, for most other presidents, uh, their time is really precious, and this kind of a waste is really bad. So another occasion when they met uh, maybe a few years ago in Florida, uh, when, when uh, their, their, their aides and met, uh, you know, maybe for the first time, they actually employ simultaneous interpretation uh, in the background. Uh, the only, uh, the, the, the way that I can tell that this is definitely using simultaneous interpretation is because, do you guys see why? It's because the U.S. side, everybody on this le left side, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the chief of, former chief of staff, former secretary of state, former secretary of defense, everybody is former, by the way, except maybe for the son-in-law, uh, but everybody is listening to the headset, and because somebody is doing simultaneous interpretation in, in the booth behind the scene, uh, so that's why they have to use the headset, otherwise this interferes with their uh, original speech, except for one person. Everybody's listening to the headset on the US side, except for one person. Do you guys see who? <laughs> President Trump himself, right? He is not listening to the headset while Xi Jinping speaks. Uh, he's just showing off his signature attitude, or you know, either his stupidity or attitude, that either he understands Chinese as if he understands Chinese, or he just rather you know, doesn't care whatever you speak, right? whatever Xi Jinping says, whatever the, the rest of the world says, I just don't care. Right? So I just don't listen to, uh, to, to the simultaneous interpretation. Uh, and this mode of interpretation is much more efficient than consecutive interpretation because the latency is not times two, but rather plus three seconds. So a one hour speech uh, in a conference will take only one hour plus three seconds uh, for the receiver uh, to understand. So that's much, much better uh, latency uh, wise than the multiplicative latency. But on the other hand, it's very, very challenging and difficult to do uh, for human beings, not just for human beings, but also for machines, but I'll get to that point later. Uh, so for example, how many people do you think in this world can perform simultaneous interpretation professionally? Like thousands or ten th tens of thousands or like hundreds of thousands or millions? Any guess? 2,000, 3,000, 5,000? The answer is only between two and three thousand, two thousand and three thousand. That's a ridiculously small number. Uh, uh, number consider how many people are bilingual in this world, right? Uh, this number is from AIIC, which is uh, International Association for Conference Interpreters. And in conference interpretation, by default, you have to do simultaneous because you just cannot do uh, consecutive inter interpretation for conferences. Um, so only three thousand uh, qualified 
professional simultaneous interpreters worldwide, well, ridiculously small number, and consider how many people are already employed in the United Nations and European Union uh, and maybe can Canadian Parliament for doing that job daily, right? Uh, and each interpreter can only sustain for about 15 to 20 minutes at maximum, and then they have to switch off. They have to work in pairs or groups of three. Um, they cannot sustain for longer than more than 20 minutes. And there is a study that after just minutes of interpretation, their error rates grow exponentially. This is just because this task is extreme uh, in this uh, you know, um, uh, parallel task that you have to do uh, simultaneous uh, perception in one language and production in the other language. And maybe just one of the two languages is native to you. Uh, and your, your brain is just not made for that, right? So you have a limited brain capacity, memory capacity, and, and, and after about 10 minutes, your brain just burned and, and cannot sustain. Um, and the best interpreters in this world can only cover about 60% of the source material. The other 40%, they just you know, compress, and, and they actually do summarization uh, along the way. Just because they, otherwise, they, if they want to translate every single bit of the source speech, they cannot catch up with the source speech, and they will lag behind more and more, and that will be disastrous. And let's just look at um, two examples of Chinese to English simultaneous interpretation in the United Nations. Uh, this is from the LDC corpora uh, of the proceeding speech on the floor. Uh, and you realize that uh, human beings, in order to accomplish this very challenging task, employ, employ several different techniques, uh, the most important of which are anticipation, summarization, generalization, and so on. And in this first example, um, so this is from Chinese to English. Let's try to play it. We support the position of Bolivia and Russia. And you can let us play again. Uh, we support the position of Bolivia and Russia. And you can see that there is a very long distance anticipation, right? So when, when the Chinese speaker just said, we support um, Bolivia, and the uh, interpreter would already know that, because this he she has seen this like millions of times in the United Nations. You know, whenever the speaker says, we support, blah, 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 it's always we support a position of. So he, she would just reorder and then she would anticipate that the position will come much later on, uh, maybe two seconds in the future. Uh, and she would reorder the Bolivia and, and Russia from, from the Chinese part uh, and to, to, to the later part in, in English, which is very uh, fluent in English world order. So that's very good. But the stuff that I sh uh, in the shadow are actually compressed and, and no, no longer mentioned in the English translation, right? So they are summarized. Uh, so the, the interpreter does summarization at the same time. Uh, and the second example. Uh, we, we believe that it is necessary for the Security Council to get involved. And you can see that in the second example, there is a very, very severe mistake in the interpretation, right? Let me see. Uh, 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 we support the position of Bolivia and uh, Russia. This is a good example, and the second one is the bad example. Uh, we, we believe that it is necessary for the Security Council to get involved. Because the source speech says it is not necessary uh, for the Security Council to get involved, but the interpretation says it is necessary. Uh, and, and kind of, if you listened more clear, uh, carefully, you would hear that she might be kind of combining two words, not and necessary, together. She's saying something like, it is necessary, it is necessary. But, but for the, for, for, the, for the receivers and for the listeners, they would just hear, oh, it is necessary instead of not necessary. And mistakes like this, it's kind of contrary, it's kind of a zero one mistake or just you know, on the complete opposite side of a sentiment happens all the time, every day, and even today, like in the United Nations. So this is just how difficult this is. There's no way that uh, human beings can be uh, doing very well on this task. So they inevitably make a lot of mistakes. Some, sometimes they correct mistakes and say, oh, oh, rather, or uh, oh, this is not true, or I mean, blah, blah, blah. They do a lot of speech repairs. But sometimes you just cannot afford to correct those mistakes, because if they do, they will lag behind even more. And let, to lag behind too much, they, they will actually um, hurt their quality. So human level quality is actually much lower. I mean, translation quality is much lower than normal uh, written translation. Uh, but human level latency is actually pretty good. Uh, it's very short. It's mostly two to four seconds, regardless of language pairs. Uh, so, because some language pairs you can do better. Some language pairs you have to wait a little bit longer, but you have to you know, trade off. Because human beings, uh, unlike machines, machines you can just say, I can do very long latency and I can be very good in quality. But human beings, 
interestingly, even higher latency actually would hurt quality because just because you have a limited capacity in your brain. And if you have a, two, a very long queue or stack, that would actually hurt uh, your ability to produce in the target language. So you'd rather flush out uh, your memory uh, constantly. You would rather keep very short memory and always be very much in sync with the speaker. And latency-wise, so, so this is the you know, a, a natural way of measure, measuring latency, just you know, how, how soon I would stop after you stop, right? About, you know, say two seconds or four seconds. Latency is longer in the second example, maybe four seconds, but much shorter in the first example. Okay, so, uh, so again, this, the, the objective of this uh, work is to do a good trade-off between latency and quality. Uh, and on the x-axis, axis, we have late, uh, higher and higher latency. Uh, on the y-axis, we have higher and higher quality. And word by word translation is the you know, fastest, but you know, word salad in, in, in you, know, you would produce English in the Chinese word order. You might be able to understand a little bit, little bit but it's not very ideal. Uh, and simultaneous interpreters will have roughly three seconds of delay, but quality is really not that good. And full sentence machine translation is you, know, you have to wait for one sentence, but the quality right now is pretty good. Uh, and I would say it's you know, very close to human level uh, quality. And the consecutive interpretation is roughly here, and the written translation, human written translation is, you know, the highest latency, because if you don't have a time constraint, you can do very well, uh, very good translation. What we wanted to do uh, is to push towards uh, the top left direction, that is low latency and high quality, and most of the existing work in simultaneous translation, uh, I would argue that roughly falls into this area that is, you know, uh, high latency, you know, higher than three seconds delay, uh, but quality-wise, all over the map. Uh, some, sometimes you can be very good in quality, um, but sometimes you can be even worse. But the main problem is actually latency. Uh, so there's not, you know, a clear previous work that demonstrates that they can do low latency, the controllable la la low latency, meaning like if I want to do arbitrary low latency, uh, or if I say three seconds delay, then you have to be three seconds delay, or five words delay, you have to be less than five words delay. There's not, not much work in that direction. So, so our direction is more on the latency side first. Okay, and for the um, purpose of this talk, I will focus mainly on this box. So this is the pipeline from uh, you know, of, of end to end speech to speech. Uh, we're not getting there so far. So what we are getting there is uh, from speech to text for the rest of this talk, for most of this talk. Uh, and I will focus mostly on the simultaneous text to text uh, translation because uh, this ASR part, the speech recognition uh, in a streaming mode, meaning like in an incremental or simultaneous mode, is a rather solved problem. And, and I'm not a speech person, so I would not get into that. So I just assume that there is speech uh, uh, ASR, uh, streaming ASR and the source text stream will, will be coming to me uh, kind of in a stream way, streaming way, and I will receive it and I will translate and output a, a, a target text stream. And this incremental text to, to speech synthesis would you know, translate this text, text stream into text uh, target stream, target speech stream. Uh, that, that will be you know, a future work. Okay, so here's the outline of uh, this talk. Uh, so I will first introduce our breakthrough uh, last year uh, and um, the uh, prefix to pref prefix framework and then um, some examples and latency metric and then part two will be uh, kind of more ambitious goal of towards flexible, adaptive or dynamic uh, translation policies and finally I will you know, talk about remaining challenges because there are just a lot of remaining challenges. This is very far from being done. So first a breakthrough last year. So uh, if you look at uh, the translation, some kind of real-time translation from Baidu two years ago, November 2017. You can see that it's actually using full sentence translation. You can see the uh, Chinese ASR is constantly growing, but the English is stopping and you know, it will only continue after a full sentence finishes. So it's still using full sentence translation. The latency is more than 10 seconds. Uh, this is not really ideal. Uh, but after our work, uh, last November, we got this fully uh, genuine la low latency simultaneous translation with latency of only about three seconds. And you can see that both Chinese ASR and English uh, subtitles are growing constantly smoothly at the same speed. Uh, so this is really simultaneous. This is the first time that this has been done, uh, you know, successfully. 
uh, and it's being covered by a lot of media, but I will not get into that. Uh, and uh, how it first started, uh, you know, uh, when Haiphong, who was the one of uh, our past ACO presidents maybe uh, three years ago, when he hired me, uh, he said, uh, you know, this is one of the high priority projects that you should consider. And I was hesitant actually at that time last year because if I were to choose, I would not choose simultaneous translation as my first project at Baidu uh, just because it's so hard. I've been thinking about this problem for a long time in the universities, but I always know that this is just extremely, extremely challenging. But, you know, in, in, a, comp in a research lab, it's different from in, in a university uh, that, you know, there is some pressure. There is some top-down directions or priorities, so you have to uh, accommodate. So I would, you know, I have to just uh, brainstorm with my students who, who came with me as interns. And uh, very luckily, we got a very simple idea, which I'll tell you in the next few slides, and it just worked in, within a week. And then we um, try and transfer this idea back to uh, the, the, the headquarters in, in, in Beijing. And the uh, translation team in Beijing, uh, led by Zhong Jun and uh, Xiong Hao, they, they implemented it on their production system, much bigger, much uh, heavier system, within a week, and it worked as well. And that's how uh, we can finally see the demo uh, when our CEO, Robin, speaks at, at the By the World Conference. Uh, so this is an amazing uh, story happening really fast, uh, mostly because our collaborators in Beijing were so good. Uh, they're so good, and, and they did all the work in doing this. I mean, we didn't do this, we just did uh, build the uh, prototype system. And at the same time, as you know, Ken Church is also part of Baidu now. Uh, he's my colleague in, in the uh, uh, Sunnyvale office. And he always wanted low latency uh, simultaneous translation because for, 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 for attending meetings, and especially the uh, director's meetings, everybody else applauded and he would only see it after two seconds or after you know, and the next slide and you know, everybody applauded and he was like, what's going on? So he was always begging me to uh, do a low latency translation and we finally did it. So uh, now to the technical materials. So the main challenge I would argue for uh, machines to do simultaneous translation is the word order difference uh, between the source and target languages. So consider if you translate from an SOV language, a subject object verb language like Japanese or German, to an SVO language like English or Chinese. Well, Chinese is a funny mix between SVO and SOV. Uh, you, you got a big problem, right? You got, you know, you got a German verb problem because the German verb doesn't come after you know uh, five seconds or so, right? Uh, so human in interpreters, as uh, we have demonstrated, routinely anticipate, that, that means go ahead of the speaker, uh, to predict the German verb. And that is explored in Grissom et al., um, one of the earliest uh, working in you know, predicting the German verb. Um, so in this particular sentence, you have to uh, wait for a really long time until you hear the, the, the German verb, gefahren. Um, but maybe you can predict it very early on with you know, the clues like the train and stuff like that, right? And same thing in um, Chinese. Uh, the Chinese verb sometimes comes in the second position like in English, sometimes comes at the end like German. Uh, so in this particular sentence, Bush president in Moscow with Russian president Putin meet. In English, you would rather say President Bush meets with Russian president, blah, blah, blah. But if you have a non-anticipative model, then you would just have to say, uh, you have to say, President Bush, blah, blah, wait, 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 until you hear the verb hui wu, or meet, and you, you, you said meets. That's really bad for, for the listener. Uh, and we, what we wanted to do is anticipative, uh, but in a way that is much more clever than, say, predicting the German verb, a uh, much more general way, uh, so that you can predict uh, meets just right here, uh, instead of at, wait, at, at the very end. So the previous solutions to this problem, uh, because of the divergent water order, they uh, you know, have many different solutions, but none of them work very well. So we divide them into two camps, industrial systems, which are practical, but not very interesting, and academic papers, which are uh, sophisticated, but not very useful. Uh, so industrial systems mostly are mostly so-called real-time translation systems that you've seen, like say Skype translate or whatever. They just use full sentence translation. And that's very bad, we've already, already seen that. Some other systems from other companies use another strategy, very funny strategy, called repeatedly retranslate. So every time you hear another word, you got a longer prefix, and you just retranslate, right? So and actually, if you type on Google Translate, Google Translate does you know, do that uh, repeated retranslate as you type. So sometimes you can just see the, the flashing uh, screen. But we argue that this is not good at all, because first of all, 
constantly, constantly changing translation is bad for user experience. And more importantly, secondly, uh, this is not genuine simultaneous translation because it cannot be used uh, for downstream speech to speech translation. Because speech to speech, anything you have already said, you cannot retract. You, you cannot say, oh, it'll go back two seconds in, in time. You cannot say that. You have to say, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. So you'd rather not change anything that you said, and if you have a mistake, you would have a way to, to fix that. But you cannot change your translation constantly. Uh, on the other hand, academic papers, which are sophisticated and interesting, uh, but they're not very useful. Uh, just to sample a few, uh, so we mentioned the explicit prediction of German verbs, and, and there's also another paper on predicting uh, maybe English verbs or some other verbs I, I forgot. Uh, and uh, several papers, not just this school at all, but several papers, including Grissom at all, use reinforcement learning uh, to decide whether to read more, meaning wait for more source words, or to write, meaning to, to emit or to commit or to other target words. Uh, and there, there are also segment-based or chunk-based methods, uh, very popular. But these efforts, I would argue, suffer from two major limitations. The first is that they still use full sentence translation models. They, they, they never retrain a model to be uh, tailored to uh, simultaneous translation tasks. And secondly, more importantly, they cannot ensure a given latency. Like if I want to say three seconds delay, at most five words delay, they cannot do that, right? Okay, so our idea is completely different and extremely simple. So our idea says, you know, forget about sequence to sequence. Just because standard sequence to sequence models is only suitable for conventional full sentence translation. Just because you have to encode a full sentence ahead of time, right? And because in simultaneous translation you don't have the full sentence ahead of time, you have them being reviewed to, reviewed to you or being available you know, simultaneously or increment, incrementally. So you have to use something completely different. So what we propose is something called prefix to prefix. That is a framework that is incremental on both sides, on both the input and output side. So that is something that is tailored to tasks with simultaneity. Not just simultaneous translation, but you can imagine you know, simultaneous TTS text-to-speech or incremental parsing, anything that is incremental on both input and output sequence sides, then you can use this framework. And as a special case, let's look at this weight K policy, which we'll use, uh, be using for the rest of this talk. Uh, basically, you would first wait for the K, first K source words. You just wait, because human beings do. And then after for the first K words, you would translate uh, concurrently, that is, one source word or one target word, one source word or one target word. So this weight two policy, here K is two, wait two words and you, you commit a first target word and another source word comes in and you, you generate another target word and so on and so forth. Uh, so the only difference be, you know, between sequence sequence and, and, and prefix to prefix is that the conditioning on the source is not on the full sentence because it's not available as I said, it's but just on a prefix that is K words, uh, sorry, K plus, uh, yeah, K words longer than the uh, target prefix that you have ju just generated, right? So that's the whole idea. And this idea is extremely simple, but uh, it has three kind of powerful implications. First, it becomes the first really like genuine simultaneous translation model, just because all previous work used full sentence, full sentence translation. And more interestingly, it has two kind of uh, byproducts. First, if you decode this way, decoding in a way, K way, then you can ensure a, a, a K word latency. All right, this is very obvious. But more importantly, if you train this way, that is you force the model to predict this word just given the first three Chinese words, then that's completely different from you know, training in a sequence to sequence way. Because training in a sequence to sequence way, you have access to the full input sentence. But what if you just have access to the first three words and you still enforce it to predict this word, even though maybe this word corresponds to somewhere very far in the future. So that's how, that's why Doing training this way, you automatically get implicit anticipation on the target side, not on the source side though, right? So most of the previous work on anticipation, like predicting the German verb, predicts the source verb or source word, source language verb, words. But we actually never say that. We would just directly predict the target side. And more interestingly, we are not even aware, the model is not even aware that it is doing anticipation at all. The model is agnostic about anticipation. It's just predicting, just generating a normal word. Whether this word is anticipated or not, the model actually cannot tell, right? I have no clue that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going ahead of the speaker or I'm, I'm going below, uh, behind the speaker. I have no idea. So here's an example. So again, President Bush, uh, after you see the first four Chinese words, Bush 
president in Moscow, uh, you would tra in training time, you would force the model to predict meats. Even though there's no meats here, there's really no meats in these four Chinese words. Meats actually come at the very end. But you just force it to say, oh, whenever you see a President Bush in some place, not necessarily in Moscow, but some you know, capital city in another country, then chances are that Bush is going to meet the other uh, president or prime minister, right? Because Bush is not Trump. What can he do in Moscow? He cannot play golf, so he'd better just meet with Putin, right? So, you know, so you can go on, and, and at the end, you have meets. But that's very, very long time after you predict meets, right? So this anticipation is integrated and implicit, uh, and it's kind of automatic. It's not like we don't never had a explicit step or action called anticipation. Like all previous work, you have to have, you have to press a button, say, anticipate the German verb, and then it would generate a German verb, and then you do something. But this is much more natural. It's seamlessly integrated into the same, it's a single model, right, without you know, knowing that I'm anticipating at all. And I would argue that for professional uh, interpreters, like very expert level professional interpreters, they actually do this like uh, without noticing it, right? So, 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 so subconsciously, that's kind of implicit anticipation. You know, without thinking, oh, you, the, the source word is hui wu, and then I translate it to meets. You know, just meets, right? And so that, that's, the, that's the whole thing, right? So, so this slide is, is everything you, that you need to know uh, from my talk, and for the rest of the talk, you can just, uh, so that's the take home message. But um, more generally, we can have a more general prefix to prefix, not necessarily weight K, we can just say, uh, every yt is, is conditioned on a prefix uh, of one to, x, one to x gt, and gt is an, as long as it's a monotonic non-decreasing function of t, and then that's okay. So gt is basically the number of source words used to predict yt. So for, for example, you can have this policy, which is not weight k, which is not concurrent, which is you know, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, sometimes more consecutive reads, sometimes more consecutive writes, uh, but this, this, uh, to generate the third, the third target word meets uh, your G3 is four, which means you need the first four Chinese words to predict it, right? And as I said, this general framework can be used for other tasks involving simultaneity, such as incremental parsing and incremental TTS, uh, but those are future work. So some demos, uh, first research demo, 江泽民对法国总统的来华访问表示感谢. So here's the detail. Jiang Zemin expressed, but expressed is anticipated. Ver, even the verb is anticipated because the real verb is expressed is here. And also the attitude, that is appreciation or gratitude, is also anticipated uh, before, long before the Chinese word uh, gratitude. And this is because in the training data, you have seen tons of sentences like this in this template. Uh, it's, it's always Jiang Zemin or maybe some other official uh, to some foreign uh, whatever official visit express gratitude or express welcome. So it's very safe to go ahead of a speaker in this context. And this is very similar to what I've seen for, uh, from a real uh, professional interpreter, right? And the second example is slightly more interesting. So uh, let's play it again. 江泽民对美国总统的发言表示遗憾. So Jiang Zemin expressed his welcome again. So it's like, oh, Jiang Zemin expressed uh, welcome too. But at the end, if you read Chinese, you would realize that, oh, I made a huge mistake just because the last word is regret instead of welcome. Because normally Jiang Zemin, Jiang Zemin is not a, like the current Chinese president. Jiang Zemin is always positive to you know, whatever foreign president uh, visit or, 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 or remarks. So he's always welcome and, you know, and, and, and positive. Uh, this is quite different from the, from the uh, a bit different from the, the current Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping, but you know. So in our training data, we, 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 we have tons of Jiang Zemin. We don't, we don't have much uh, Xi Jinping, right? Because Xi Jinping is more, more recent. So, so we, we train on this uh, data, Newswire data, and the Newswire just likes to say Jiang Zemin express welcome. And if you are like weight three, you, you, you're a little bit too aggressive, right? So you make mistakes like this. This human beings make all the time, right? And if you're just slightly more conservative, you wait five, that is two more words delay, then you, you're just right able to uh, predict, uh, to, 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 sorry, to translate without any anticipation and you just see the, the, uh, the regret, right? So. Jiang Zemin Right, so 
right? Okay, and our deployment demo that we've already seen, right? So, uh, and for non-Chinese speakers in the audience, I do have a non-Chinese example from German to English, and as, as we already said, German is the most interesting case because the German verb is just so ridiculously uh, nasty. Uh, and here, you can see that uh, both the auxiliary verb can and the main verb, anagon, which is agree, are anticipated, but uh, you know, say, okay, so it should be, while Congress cannot agree on a course of action, but our translation, simultaneous translation says, does not agree, but you know, that's fine. You know, if a simultaneous interpreter makes that kind of semi-mistakes, he or she wouldn't bother, right? As long as we have the main verb correct and we have the sentiment uh, correct, we didn't miss a negation, because sometimes German negations are also at the very end, that's extremely bad, right? Nicht at the very end, and you oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to add a negation. Uh, this is like opposite of from what I said. You know, German is always nasty, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, also, we, 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 we developed a new latency metric as a byproduct of our research called average lagging. And this is because previous metrics uh, proposed by Gu et al. and, and, and Cho and Esipova, uh, like consecutive weights and average proportion, uh, do not measure directly the level of lagging behind. How much time lag, time lag is, is there uh, between the source speech and your interpretation or translation? So we devised a new metric called average lagging, or AL, which measures the, on average, how many source words uh, the translation lags behind the source speech. Uh, so ideally, AL of weight K should be, roughly speaking, K, if the source and target have the same length, but, but they, they, they don't have the same length in practice. So and it turns out that only recently, after the publication of this paper, we discovered that there is a related, very closely related metric called ear voice span, a concept called EVS, in the interpretation literature uh, that is very closely related to our uh, average lagging, even though we didn't know that metric when we developed this. So the basic idea is, you know, so this is a target, this is source, and this is Diagonal line is the ideal translation. Ideal translation meaning like you're really concurrent with the source speech. And then your, your actual translation is like read, read, uh, and write, write, and read, read, and write, write, and read, read, write, and blah, blah, blah. And then this portion here, above the diagonal line is your average, is your lagging, and you just compute the average amount of lagging uh, uh, for all the uh, target words, and that's your average lagging. And this is roughly speaking here, very similar to, to EVS. EVS EBS actually is more sophisticated in the sense that it would measure, for example, it would sample a few words and measure the, the latency. For example, Bolivia. Bolivia has quite a, quite a lot of latency because Bolivia is reordered to the very end of English speech. But on the other hand, position has a neg negative latency, so it would, they would cancel out. It would compute the average latency this way uh, to compute the air voice span, and you would realize it's about two to four seconds um, in, in practice. So this is very interesting. And here are our experiments from uh, German into and from and into English and, and, and also bidirectional from Chinese into and from English. And we can see that in, in all four cases, uh, our weight K is uh, much better than the uh, RL method from Gu et al. Uh, and this is our adaptation of their method on the same transformer baseline. Um, and uh, this, another line is called test time weight K, which is basically not retraining the model, just use full sentence, full sentence translation model, but just decode with a weight K. So this is much simpler, you don't need to retrain, and it works actually okay, right? Sometimes it's even better than the reinforcement learning method, which is much more complicated and brittle to, to train. Okay, just to summarize the first part, uh, the prefix to prefix framework, which is very different from sequence to sequence, uh, is, a framework that is tailored to simultaneity on both sides, that is incremental on both sides, and has three implications, very powerful implications. It's the first genuinely simultaneous translation model, not trained on full sentence pairs. And if you decode like this, you have controllable latency. And if you train like this, you automatically get a byproduct, which is implicit uh, anticipation on the target side. And it's very easy to train, and it's very scalable, and it only involves minor changes to most existing neural NMT code base. Uh, so that's why we, we actually, my students actually did it in just one week after we got this idea. Uh, and it's, this is also very general, can be applied to other tasks with simultaneity, which I had mentioned, and we also devised a new metric latency, um, new latency metric which resembles the uh, metric used in, in interpretation literature. 
Okay, so now I will move on to the second part, uh, which is, you know, for the second and third parts, we, I will be um, mo much more brief. Uh, so towards adaptive or dynamic or flexible translation policies. So, so far what you have seen is fixed latency policies, always wait k. You wait first k words, and then you concurrently translate. So it's always fixed latency. It's very rigid, uh, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it. So there's a you know, two by two table. So, on the, uh, so there's full sentence translation models like before this work, right? Um, and there are two columns. One is fixed latency methods, and the other is adaptive policy methods. It turns out that most of the previous work are adaptive but full sentence translation models like the reinforcement work. What we have achieved uh, in the previous part is the weight K model, which is a you know, simultaneous model, not full sentence model, using prefix to prefix, but a, a fixed latency policy. So in this box is the best of both worlds where you have a you know, simultaneous model, but you also have an adaptive or dynamic policy. And it turns out that there was a paper from Google uh, which were presented yesterday at the uh, poster session. Uh, this is uh, a paper from Google Translate team, and this is uh, based on our Wait K work, and they actually did it very fast because our work was only uh, on archive, released on archive in October, and they quickly uh, re-implemented it and you know, did something much better uh, that is going to be uh, adaptive, and that was the paper, unfortunately, presented yesterday. Uh, hopefully, you have, have seen it. Uh, but tomorrow, there's another short talk uh, that I will give uh, that is also on, in this box that is adaptive and simultaneous, so I will not talk too much about it. Uh, just to give you some idea that fixed latency can be bad, right? Um, so it can be sometimes too aggressive when your case is too small, and that means going too fast and you anticipate too much. So you, you're not confident enough to anticipate and you still anticipate, you've got anticipation errors. So for example, if you wait one and you say, oh, I have not received relevant and Chinese set, side says department, and you anticipate the relevant, what relevant documents, that's an anticipation error from relevant departments, and then realize later that you, you see, oh, that's an anticipation error. It's actually response, not documents. But it's too late, I cannot fix it. Uh, so that's common. But on the other hand, it can be too conservative or too slow with larger K. So if your K is four, uh, you, you can do perfect translation, but it's too slow. You waited too long, and your AAO is four, and this way one is AAO is 1.4. Uh, so a, something in between this, you know, adaptive or flexible uh, says I, and here you just say two words in a row, have not, because, you know, it's very obvious that yet not is have not, received, and then you have to really wait, because you then have to wait for the, for the Chinese noun that is response, and you, you wait until you see, you heard a noun and you say, oh, response from blah, blah, blah. So here you have to do a lot of consecutive wait, and here you can do consecutive, consecutive write. So sometimes you do consecutive reads, sometimes you do consecutive writes. And so there are reads and write actions from you know, previous work as well. So each position you, you would decide on the fly where you want to wait for more source words that is read or just commit more target words that is write. Uh, and previous work, like Gu et al., uh, very beautiful work, by the way, um, just, you know, it's too hard to train and, uh, you know, it's also too complicated in, in the sense that it involved two models. One is a full sentence translation model and then the other is a read-write model. And it doesn't work as well as weight K and it's much more complicated to, to, uh, to implement. Actually, our weight K is so easy to implement and, and we spend most of our time uh, re-implementing Google uh, in our work. Uh, and so the question is, can we learn a better model with adaptive policy and, and simpler models, right? Simpler methods. So our, our key idea, which I'll present tomorrow, um, it's actually the last talk tomorrow, uh, last session, uh, is a single model with read as a word. So we just add read as a dummy word into the vocabulary, so vocabulary size plus one now. And then every single time you just decide whether you want to you know, generate a read word or just an, an, any other word, but this is just, you know, the same, in, in, in the same model because the model just can choose whatever word. It, it, when it chooses read, it will just read, right? So, but how do, you, how do you learn that policy? You know, because it's adaptive and it, there's no ground truth. There's no annotation about the, the best policy. So we have to do some imitation learning and, you know, what we call restricted imitation learning, um, which I will not talk about now. Uh, you can come to my talk tomorrow. Uh, it's rather more involved. Uh, but I'll present a much simpler idea here, uh, which I think works actually better. So which on the fly, again, on the fly decides whether I should wait or read or, or write, which is, you know, commit. Depending just on the probability 
or entropy or you know, confidence level or whatever metric that you can apply on the probability of the next word, right? If it's not confident enough, that is, if, if the, this pro probability falls behind, below a threshold, then you just read. You say, oh, I'm not confident enough for, you know, because the top word that I'm going to generate has a probability, pro probability less than, say, 0.1. Then I'd better just wait and read. And then, which means that I have to switch to a one step more conservative policy, that is K plus one. Otherwise, if I'm confident enough, I will just write, right? I will just commit whatever word I, 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 I have. And then at the same time, you want to attempt to write another word, because you, you always want to try consecutive writes, right? Because otherwise, you cannot catch up with the speaker. Uh, so that you would switch to a more one step more aggressive model, that is K degrees, decreases by one. So you can, you can have all these policies from weight one to weight five, and you can, you can choose, okay, I want read, and then write, and maybe write two words, and read two words, and so on and so forth. You know, on the fly decided by the probability or the entropy or whatever. And so that's for uh, the uh, dynamic or flexible policies. Unfortunately, I did not have a slide for, for the Google paper, which I should have, as it's a beautiful paper also by itself. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, uh, for, the, for the final minutes, I'll talk about the remaining challenges because this is far from being done. So even though we kind of made a breakthrough, but you, know, you, you might argue that I did not make a breakthrough either way, but uh, it's far from being done. This is a very, very challenging task, and it's one of the holy grails of AI. It's one of the most difficult tasks. Uh, so first, there are a lot of problems related to ASR. Uh, just because we got tons of errors or noise from the ASR output, and right now, because I, I, I see this, this uh, being demoed um, uh, live in many locations, including you know, the, the uh, director's meetings, and most of the errors come from ASR. The, the translation errors are rather rare, actually. Uh, so how do you cope with ASR noise? Um, you know, homophone noise, for example, is a big problem, which I'll talk about uh, you know, a little bit in the next slide. Uh, and code switching, right? So a lot of Chinese speech, especially technical Chinese speech, involves a lot of English terms like AI, for example, right? And deep learning, you know, if you hear Chinese people talking to each other in this conference, chances are they're talking about deep learning, deep learning. You, even if you don't understand Chinese at all, you hear a lot of deep learning, AI, deep learning, you know, NLP, uh, a lot of things, right? How do you do that in ASR? That's extremely difficult. Uh, and sentence breaking and prosody that is lost in translation um, and some people like Google propose to do directly speech to speech without text to text. That's more aggressive and ambitious, which I, I think will be safe for future work. And now next is a big problem that is I haven't done yet, or actually I'm, we're doing, is incremental text to speech. That's extremely challenging, right? Um, it's just like uh, translation. We know very well how to do full sentence text to speech using neural models like um, you know, tackle Tron, but we don't know how to do it, you know, if I just give you one word at a time, right? But this is definitely possible with prefix to prefix, again. And better data set, data, data set for training simultaneous translation systems, that, that will kind of uh, uh, get into a little bit more detail. And finally, detecting and fixing mistakes, especially the anticipation errors, which are, you know, a lot, right? So first, uh, this is actually a paper that we will be presenting right after this talk in the poster session. Uh, my colleague, Hyron uh, Liu, uh, did a paper which is robust neural emission translation with phonetic information uh, together with text information so that for homophone noise, like, you know, you know, these two Chinese words sound roughly the same, but ASR just makes this kind of mistake all the time. They have yo or yo, and it would full, totally fool a uh, transformer. The transformer got this word and you know, just got completely uh, and completely off, and, and if we add the, the phonetic information of the pinging into uh, the embedding, then you, know, you can recover the good translation. That's great, and for code switching, as I said, it's extremely difficult, and for technical Chinese speech, and here's a demo from, by the way, SR. It's not my team, but it's um, a team in uh, Beijing. Hello, everyone. Interestingly, if, if you uh, can see, if I, let, let's see if I can uh, play here. So if, when, when the speaker mentions model, then if you read Chinese, then you can see that initially it recognizes to 
cat model, right? So uh, you can see here. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. 我们每天的工作当中，通常会有出一门存在解说的时候，比如我们会说你的这个新 model 效果比 baseline 好多少？看你的技术的代。Right, but this is amazing, right? So this is something that nobody else can do. Uh, only Baidu can do very well. Uh, and now, better data set uh, for training tra simultaneous translation. We argue that it's very easy to realize that standard parallel text you know, used for training machine translation systems are not good for simultaneous translation, even though our current work still uses, and not just our current work, but everybody's current work still uses this kind of data set, uh, because there, in, there are too many unnecessary long distance reorderings, because it's just made for recent translation. You can reorder anyhow, you know, any, any time you want. But you know, simultaneous interpretation, you can't reorder a lot, right, just because there is you know, latency requirement and, and memory capacity. Uh, on the other hand, some people argue that you can use simultaneous interpretation corpora, like the one I, I showed from United Nations, uh, from LDC, but that's not ideal either, because, well, because first of all, they contain too many mistakes, as we, as we have seen, and a lot of speech repairs, like, uh, I mean, you know, uh, and a lot of compressions. It only translates about 60% of the source material. So again, our goal is not, like, you know, mimicking human interpretation, or interpreters, we actually, we think that is uh, not a very ambitious goal. We actually aim to go beyond that level because human level is very low in that task, as we said. So our goal is short latency like human interpretation, like two to four seconds delay, but much better quality like human written translation. So this is something that is very ambitious and uh, not being seen before. Uh, so if our simultaneous TTS would work, then we can connect this end-to-end, speech-to-speech, uh, simultaneous translation pipeline, then we would provide to the user for the first time uh, that is a very different user experience that you would hear the translation uh, in a very smooth kind of uh, speed uh, instead of like blah, 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 mm, and pause for five seconds and blah, 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 and five, pause for five seconds, which is more like in you know, human interpretation, which is because you have to listen and, and speak and listen and speak and alternate and between the two languages. But we try to aim at a very different user experience uh, that is a very smooth uh, uh, translation covering like 100% instead of 60% of the source material. So this is very different from mimicking human interpretation. Uh, like this kind of mistakes are very bad. And you can see that for, for the example on the right, so about Clintonism, no accurate definition. The reference translation is there is no accurate definition of Clintonism, which is perfect for written translation. For training machine translation system, that's perfect. But it's not good for training simultaneous translation. Why don't you just say about Clintonism, there's no accurate definition? What's wrong with that, right? So there, there is no reordering. The, the, trans, the old, word order is isomorphic uh, between the two languages. Why don't you just do that? In, in fact, a topicalization in the source should be topicalized in the, in the target as well. So uh, whereas some reorderings are more mandatory, for example, uh, these PPs modifying VPs or MPs in Chinese are always fronted and you have to move the, to, to the after NP or VP in English. Th those are mandatory reorderings that you cannot omit. But optional reorderings like the sentential PPs, you just, you know, you, you don't need to reorder. So we aim to rephrase the target side of Bitex so that we can get rid of the uh, unnecessary long distance reorderings so that we can train the system with better latency. And finally, detecting and fixing mistakes, as I said, you know, you likely to have a lot of anticipation errors. And the idea is we use a slightly lower, slower or more conservative policy to kind of, kind of go along with the uh, current more aggressive policy and always verify uh, the current policy's output. For example, uh, for this sentence, Bush president in Moscow attend instead of meet, right? Because you always say, oh, Bush president in Moscow uh, would always you know, meet with somebody. But it, it turns out to be some other verb, which is unli unlikely. But the way to decode, way to policy would just say President Bush met after seeing Moscow, and way three model would after one step realize that, oh, actually it should not be met. The, the probability of met in way three model is zero, or very close to zero. It says, oh, you better make a, mis make a correction. And then it would redecode using way three model, and it would add a speech repair, like I mean, or, or rather, or whatever. It's kind of rule based. Uh, and then you say, I mean, attend it then you would continue on the way three policy and the important summit in Moscow. So the translation would read as President Bush met, oh, I mean attended. 
an important submit in Moscow, which is very similar to what human interpreters would do uh, in practice. So, okay, at the end, I would say that the point of this talk is uh, to Pao Zhuan Yu, which I don't know how to translate in English, but I just tried Google and Baidu. Google says throw bricks, and uh, Baidu says something better. Throw away a brick in order to get a gem. Uh, just, so what I have talked so far is uh, are bricks, and uh, what I hope that is to stimulate interests uh, from this community in this long-standing and far-reaching and, and problem that is far from being solved. And so this is my goal. And with that, I would like to thank you in, uh, you know, simultaneously. Um, this is actually real output from our real system. It's not fake. Um, and the code will be available on, on Paddle, uh, NLP. And this Paddle is, is um, it's originally made by Baidu, but it's open source and everybody's developing it. It's, it's kind of a, uh, both uh, TensorFlow and, 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 and PyTorch, it supports both static and dynamic graphs. And the code for robust decoding with ASR noise, which we'll be presenting next after the, the, the coffee break, is already available on there, but the main paper is not available yet. Uh, and we'll be having two posters on this topic uh, after the coffee break uh, in session 4A, and a short talk tomorrow at the end in this room. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have, we have time for some questions. People can step up to the microphone. Yeah, so it seems like a lot of anticipation is domain dependent, you know, diplomatic means versus technical conferences. It seems like we need a good domain adaptation algorithm even more important here than in other MT to adapt to the characteristics of the domain? Sure, that, that's a very good point. In fact, human interpreters do homework. They always do homework before the, the, the day before their interpretation. And, and we should, you know, if, if you trans, uh, train on uh, Newswire and uh, then you deploy on music, that would be terrible. It would actually dip, uh, do some, try to do some domain adaptation the day before <laughs> on music. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so uh, I wanted to stand up a little bit for interpreters, and so uh, yeah. you're uh, aiming to go to superhuman levels, but there are a lot of things that interpreters do that computers cannot do. Uh, yeah. They can uh, avoid insulting people. So even if the translation model has high probability for calling someone uh, a lazy uh, bum, uh, you know as a translator you probably shouldn't say that or even just like look at the person to make sure that do you really want to say that. And uh, these are things that computers cannot do yet. And so, uh, and these are things that if we wanted to deploy this in the real world at the United Nations or at important high level meetings that they should do. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on how to do these sorts of things that only humans can do at the moment? That's a very good point, and I know you like uh, human interpreters, and you would like <laughs> to kind of uh, provide assistance for them, right? So, but um, I would argue that, uh, um, yes, for sure, I agree with you that uh, there are a lot of things that computers cannot do. But on the other hand, uh, there was a tenet that uh, you have to be very faithful to the original speech. So even if the original speech is insulting, you have to be insulting. Um, <laughs> um, even if it's we're, we're stupid, you have to be stupid. Uh, so uh, in that sense, machines might be more faithful. But uh, uh, yeah, for, for the other things, I, I think, think we uh, just need more work. Uh, and I don't have a good answer for, for those very clever stuff that cleverly machines cannot do right now, like humor, for example. Right. Yeah. And, and for example, there was a saying that how do you translate a joke uh, simultaneously? You, most, time, most people actually just say, oh, the speaker is actually telling a joke, and uh, would you please just laugh? And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> machines cannot do that. You know, but machine, <laughs> right. yeah. Machines can detect humor. If, if they could, then they would insert this sentence. Uh, kind of, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the great talk and the great progress. So um, while we were working on Skype Translator uh, years back, uh, one of the uh, like most challenging uh, points was the disfluency handling. And like when spontaneous speech, people start repeating, I like, uh, like I mean fillers, and all that. So that really uh, get a uh, uh, huge impact on the quality of the translation, as well as sentence breaking. So how uh, do you think the disfluency handling and uh, sentence breaking fit into that framework here? 
Okay, so, uh, so this is about uh, the remaining challenges, uh, and I listed sentence breaking as one of the challenges because, um, so if you use, uh, say, uh, whatever speech AS API is, uh, uh, from, from online, a lot of them have problems in, in sentence breaking. Uh, Baidu's, our internal stuff doesn't have that problem, but, but um, if you use any other company's online freely available uh, API for streaming ASR, chances are that they have problems with sentence breaking. Um, but uh, uh, I don't have a very good way to, to solve that right now, but uh, one easy way is just to say uh, you can consider the whole paragraph as a very long sentence, so you don't need to do sentence breaking at all. Uh, so th that's fine, you know, but, uh, but if you could do sen sentence breaking, that the still is better uh, in most cases. Um, it, it, does that answer your question? Uh, what about this fluency handling? Like handling of this fluency. Yeah, this fluency and, and, and fillers. Yeah. Actually, sometimes it's very beneficial if you would just add some fillers uh, when you know you are waiting for stuff. You say, uh, or just some semantically vacuous words like function words, for example, right? So like here's the. You just say something. As long as you say something, anything, and the listener would just say, oh, the, you know, the, the interpreter is still doing the work. He, he's not falling asleep or whatever, right? So otherwise, if 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 the interpreter is waiting for the German verb, you know, for five seconds, and, and the um, so that's why there's a famous joke in the United Nations when the, 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 the listener would ask the interpreter, what are you doing? Why are you not translating? And the he would say, I'm waiting for the German verb. But if you can just you know, add some fillers uh, sometimes, uh, or, or, or function words, or just semantically vacuous words, uh, while you are waiting for the German verb, uh, that would be very beneficial as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, have you given any thought to the notion of uh, what a high cost should be, or what the cost should be? So when we worked on this uh, with imitation learning as well, yeah. um, we were trying to balance accuracy and, uh, and expeditiousness. Um, but if you think about it, some mistakes have higher costs than yeah. others, right? So right. in a high stakes situation, right. like with, with the president, right? So right. some mistakes have very high cost, or maybe a repair should have a high cost. So have you thought about how you might get a model to learn, or how, you, how would you even identify and annotate something like that? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, the cost of fixing a mistake, yeah, so, so simultaneous interpreters always measure that kind of cost, and most of the time they would just pass. They would just go on and with, without fixing the mistake. It's just too costly to fix a mistake in speech to speech, because uh, you would lag behind even more. Uh, we currently don't have a way to, 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 to decide on that, but it's, it's a very deep question. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I, if I would say, uh, we have some thoughts that uh, if this sentiment is completely opposite, if you can, you can, you can look at it by you know, wording embedding or whatever, but it's you know, a, a little bit hard for wording embedding to see antonyms, but if you can see antonyms from the embeddings or whatever, then uh, you can say, oh, that's a very bad mistake. Uh, or if I missed a neg negation, like the not necessary, not necessary. Th that, those are something that I have to fix, because otherwise it would be uh, diplomatic relation problems. But uh, uh, other mistakes, uh, you would just pass. You, you just kind of quantify the uh, difference in, in, in sentiment in, in these two words. Yeah, that's my, my thought. Yeah, thank you. As uh, one of the 3,000 interpreters, <laughs> I can say I'm uh, glad that elements from interpretive practice are taken into account in uh, this type of research. Thank uh, you. However, one other element that is very important for us when we uh, interpret is that the output, the rate we output, the words, is also uh, made in a way that leads to a logical completion of the meaning, because this is very important for the audience to understand the message. Yeah. Uh, so, so far I've seen most papers in simultaneous uh, translation celebrating that they achieve very good quality by measuring blue score. However, I haven't seen any metric or any way to measure uh, what is a good latency. Because short, I see that short means good for you, but how short is good? So I wonder if you have really any way of measuring this. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And thank you for, for being one of the 3,000 interpreters worldwide to attend my, my talk. I was very honored to have you in the audience. Um, and I totally agree that blue score is not the right metric to measure the quality, at least uh, for simultaneous translation, because, because many problems, which I will not go into details, but because we, we look at the, uh, the error messages and the output, and we, we realize that blue is just not the right way to do it. Uh, but on the latency side, uh, we try to keep the latency and the quality kind of orthogonal, kind of as entangled as possible. 
so that you can achieve very high latency, uh, sorry, very good latency, mean, which means very short latency, and, and then complete independently uh, very good or very bad quality. So we try to let them be, let the two metrics be as independent as possible. But I also agree that sometimes they, 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 they have in, in, intercorrelations, and I, I don't know how to, how to measure the uh, quality, actually. What's the best way to do it? I actually don't know. Last question. Oh, okay. Oh, you. Uh, well, two questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your great talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the, the your term, the prefix to prefix. Yes. So I, I understand, you know, so the, the, that means. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, so uh, usually it, it's kind of some the sequence to sequence model. Mm -hmm. So with the latency, with some work. So usually, so when we talk about the prefix, then uh, we can imagine the pre some part of the uh, some um, part of the string uh, and word. So, but actually, the, 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 the input and the output is a, a sequence of words. Mm -hmm. so, so do you want to stick to the, the, the prefix to prefix? I, some, I mean, some, the, my suggestion is the, so using the sequence to sequence um, um, model so with some, the other some modifications, like some latency of some words or something like that. So the prefix, the, the term, can uh, confuse us. So we can oh, imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So, so, so several reviewers actually pointed this out, that prefix always means like within a word, yeah, yeah, few, few you're, characters, you're right. yes, yes, so yes. That, that, that's why yeah, right, I'm right, right, right. So I, 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 I totally understand. So that's yeah. my recommendation. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So there was a last question from Jason? Or? Um, okay, sure. If, if I give Google Translate the sentence, the where, soup where is, is hot it? because I can see the steam, and I ask it to translate it into Spanish, it correctly translates hot into calor. If I give it the sentence, the soup is hot because it contains jalapeno peppers, it still translates it into physically hot calor rather than spi picante, it's spicy. Uh -huh. And it does that for every language pair that I've looked, every language I've looked at. I'm wondering if Baidu has looked at evaluating lexical ambiguity in the context of speech recognition and translation. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues in Beijing uh, have done something on that, but I myself haven't done it. So uh, unfortunately, they, they, they were not here today, so, so I would I'm unable to, to answer that question, but, but that's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's, let's thank our speaker again. You can ask him more questions at his future college. Thank you. Thank you.